in very real ways, I stand before you literally as a product of the power of hachnasat orchim, of welcoming strangers. And in very real ways, I'm alive literally here today because of the mitzvah of hachnasat orchim, because my mother was one of the 1,300 children who survived war in hiding in the French countryside. At great risk to themselves, my, uh, my aunt and my mother were hidden by some seven Christian families, a bunch of nuns in monasteries and orphanages. And had they not been available to them, that had that not opportunity been available to them, they would certainly not have made it. My father had been taken in the beginning of the war, sent to Drancy and then to Auschwitz. I am literally here because of the care of strangers. I'm going to share with you the beginning of the next story because Hachnasat Rochim is not only um, powerful on my mother's side, it's powerful on my dad's side too. My great-grandmother Hannah lived in Romania. They decided with uh, Grandpa Sam to move to, the, to Canada. They chose Winnipeg, it's very cold. They ended up moving to Pittsburgh. And my, I remember my great-grandmother, I was very young, but I actually remember this stocky woman who spoke Yiddish and a bit of broken English, smelled of onions and rugelach, you know. And as a young immigrant from, from Romania with Grandpa uh, Sam, and they raised three kids in McKee's Rocks, and she joined a little Orthodox shul there, and the board decided to ask uh, Mr. Rive, who was a communist and poor, who had not had no penny to you know to show for himself, to not come for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur services. They actually blackballed a communist from shul. My great grandmother stood up in the meeting and said, "Is this a shul?" She said, if there is no room for Mr. Rive in this shul, there is no room for me. And she stood up. And now, you understand what's going on. It's kind of, McCarthy is brewing in America. Like, you know, the fears were real. My grandmother, great-grandmother stood up and said, I am not going to live in a shul that doesn't welcome in anybody. And she began what was called, in McKee's Rocks, literally, the rebel shul. And everybody knew in McKee's Rocks that my great-grandmother ran a minion, served rugelach in the morning for the men who came, and much as herring, if you could stay long enough to finish the minion. And, and she, would she would send the boys out, my father out, to grab people for the minion if there wasn't the minion. My great-grandmother decided that it was important for every Jew to find a home. The values that mark our, our identity as Jews is that no one is locked out, no one is stripped of membership, everyone is welcome. We are a strange people because we are deeply committed to welcome. And I want to talk about the roots of that commitment. But we are also a profoundly exclusive community. We are a community that demands high levels of commitment. You can't convert simply in this community. It takes a year of study and commitment, right? We are a community that uh, sees ourselves as unique and different, and our identity is locked up in a sense of specialness that is, to some extent, exclusive and deeply committed to inclusive values. What I want to speak about tonight is not the duty to welcome, but the complexity and challenge and difficulty, and despite it, the necessity of welcome. I actually want to complicate what it means to be a welcoming community and to deepen the commitment to do it despite how painful and difficult it can be. So I want to start with the DNA of the mitzvah of Hachnasat Orchim. The commandment of welcoming the stranger emerges directly out of biblical texts. It is in the DNA of the Jewish people because it's about Abraham and Sarah. They are our mother and our father. And the story 
goes like this. Three hungry, tired travelers are accosted by an old man. He runs out to go get them, limping toward them. He's just had a circumcision that he performed on himself. He beseeches them to come back with him, have some nourishment, and then prepares, you know, sends them on their way. And the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre. And, and he sat at the tent of the door at the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, and he saw them, and he ran to greet them from the door tent, the tent door, and bowed himself low to the ground. My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not leave your servant. And they stayed and came into the house. And that story is the beginning of the kind of frame of reference that claims that it's fundamentally Jewish, fundamentally central to the covenantal identity, to be the kind of person who runs out and welcomes in guests. Okay, the rabbis have a choice when they read this. This story of welcome could be read quite simply. It is read in a really interesting and actually kind of somewhat non-intuitive fashion. When it says, and the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, what is it talking about? Is that a description of an independent revelation? Or is it the three angels that come? In other words, those three men that come, they end up being angels. They're going to tell him about Sarah is going to give a birth to a child, right? So the rabbis read it this way. The Lord appeared to him not in the form of three angels. That's the ordinary, reasonable way to read. No, the Lord came to visit him because he was sick and not feeling well. Abraham had the, among the first revelatory powers of visually having some contact with God. Now, at that, just that moment, he sees three strangers out of the corner of his eye. So here's what the rabbis do with this story. Rav Judah says in the name of Rav, hospitality to wayfarers is greater than welcoming the presence of the Shekhinah, that's the presence of God, for it is written, my Lord, if I have found favor in thy sight, don't pass away. Now, I'm going to translate this very quickly for you, but here's what they're saying. Abraham is in this experience and sees out of the corner of his eye three needy travelers, and he says to God, you know what, Lord, I know this is incredible, but I'm sorry, but I got to go take care of something. Don't go. You, in my Lord, usually is translated as the the angels, right? No, no. It's God he's talking to. And so the rabbis learn the following. It is greater to receive guests, to receive the stranger in your home, than to receive the presence of God. I, whenever I speak in synagogues, I encourage the cantor and rabbi by saying, imagine on one of the most powerful days of the year, it could be Rom Kippur, it could be Rosh Hashanah, whatever, and the sermon is amazing. And the music is inspiring. And the presence of the divine, the Shrina begins to rest in the congregation. There's an aura of a cloud in the space. Everyone is exultant. The roof seems to lift off. It's so incredibly moving. And there's a man at the door in a wheelchair kicking the door because he can't get in because all your greeters have come to watch the presence of God in the sanctuary. And you have utterly failed. means other people's needs are more important than my spiritual desires. My spiritual needs have to be second to the responsibility I have to take care of others. The first principle of Jewish welcome is a priority principle. The pri our priorities are welcome precedes religious engagement. Now, that's a very interesting commitment, and it's one that's challenging to do in all kinds of settings. I just want to set it out there that it's deeply ingrained in the tradition that this is a piece of our identity as a people. The Rambam translates this mitzvah of welcoming the stranger into very clear halachic terms. Let's go take a look at the Rambam. Rambam says the following. It's a positive mitzvah to visit the sick, 
to comfort the mourner, to bury the dead, to accompany the guests on their way, to gladden the bride and the groom, and to help them put together their new home. These are gemilut chasadim, accomplish which one's body, which there's no limit to them. The specifics are defined by the sages, but they are all under the rubric of love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the, this is the point of this, this paragraph. All of the things that you would want others to do for you, do them for others who are your brothers in Torah and mitzvot. So here's the piece that's both exciting, somewhat challenging too. And that is, the mitzvah, the commandment of love thy neighbor as thyself, is broad. All of the specific obligations of visiting the sick and comforting the mourners and burying the dead, all of them are expressions of just loving your neighbor as yourself. And what is loving your neighbor as yourself? What do you need? Do it for others. Our obligation to others emerges out of an understanding of what it is that we need. When we are aware of our human needs, then love thy neighbor as thyself obligates us to provide them for others, and it plays out in all of the commandments that, that are associated with rabbinic you know, tradition about dowering the bride and visiting the sick. Why do we visit the sick? Because if I was sick, I would want someone to come and spend time with me too. All the mitzvot are associated with a hafta l'reacha kamocha. Now here he does something that is kind of odd. The reward of accompanying the guest on his journey is greater than the rest. This is the law of Abraham, our father, established, and it is the way of kindness that he practiced to feed travelers and give them drink and accompany them on their journey. Greater is giving, is receiving guests than receiving the presence of the Shekhinah. As it says, he looked up and behold, there were three men. Now, before we get into the last line, the Rambam rarely quotes Midrash. He's a halachist in this book. This is the Yada Chazaka, it's his law book. Why does the Rambam quote the Midrash of greater is receiving guests than Abraham looked up and the, the angels were there and it's actually, he said, no, you know, God, wait, I'm gonna go get the angels, I'm gonna go get the men and bring them in. The reason is, is that this mitzvah, this fulfillment of love thy neighbor as thyself, is somehow more profound than the rest? And why is that so? Why should it be that better, more powerful than burying the dead or dowering the bride is welcoming in the stranger? What's the reason for that? I think the reason for that is, is that it's inside the identity of the children of Abraham and Sarah. Our very DNA, culturally, is to live in spaces that are open and inviting to people in need. The people in this room are committed to this. That's why you're here. This is actually, in a way, a Rambam that identifies the profundity of your work and the centrality, the religious centrality of your work to the very essence of what it means to be a Jew. And then he says something actually quite shocking accompanying them on their journey. Now, this is what happens. Abraham welcomes in the strangers, and then he walks with them along the way. Accompanying them is even greater than receiving them. And the sages said, all who do not accompany the stranger who is your guest, it's as if you spilled blood. Now, why should it be that, if you, that you have to accompany the stranger, and if you don't, it's strange that it's, it's as if you spilled blood. What's the point of actually highlighting that accompaniment? The only reason accompaniment should be that important is that there must have been a sense of threat or danger, a sense of, of th threat to the people who were once in your home safe but now outside your door. Look. We mark it. My Rebbe used to do this all the time. He used to walk us out from the door three blocks. It was very lovely. What does it feel like to not be accompanied to the door when you're in someone's home? It's very strange. You feel actually ignored, right? Almost like good riddance. What does it feel like to be taken to the door? You feel, okay, great. What does it feel like to be walked out onto the street? It means I, I, I don't want to leave you. And what does it mean to be walked part of the way? So what they're claiming is, I think the Rambam is claiming this, and it's true in that story, is that the outside world was a threatening place. And therefore, this isn't any ordinary stranger, but whom? 
These are strangers who in the public square might be threatened. And therefore, what does walking with them do? It protects them socially, potentially otherwise, but it communicates what? Uh, they, uh, and not only that, but you're, you're communicating to your neighbors. What are you communicating? They are under my, my protection now, too. No, if you, if you do anything to them, you do it to me first, right? So on some level, there's this commitment that once someone comes into your door, you're obligated to them in your home. That's the ancient commitment to welcoming travelers. But then it doesn't stop there. Today, in public schools all over America, young people are forming gay-straight alliances. Now, it's a way for friends to rally behind the gay kids, but it serves as a shield of sorts. Because not only is there a school administrator that's involved with it and an advisor, but there are straight kids, hopefully kids like my dad on the football team. There are people who are walking with you in the halls if you are nervous that someone might call you a name. This is actually a, a deep fulfillment of like the, the commitment to caring for strangers. It is the GSA in a school is the perfect example of the kind of mitzvah of welcoming in the stranger. Okay, what does that mean? Give us a space that's quiet in the room to be able to be safe. But then don't let us at the door walk into the public space, right? It is also about the political and social activism that you can be proud of, but that is needed, no doubt, more, that matters. It matters that people speak out. It matters that there's public expression of our desire for equality and freedom and, and fairness, right? This is not only meets vote that we do in our homes and in our communities, but this is an expression of the larger political responsibilities we bear. Now, so the two frames I've kind of brought up so far are the priority of the ethical, the commitment to the human needs in front of you beyond, or, in, or I say prior to your religious needs. And the second is the obligation is actually doesn't end at the door, but it requires us to, be, to be create public spaces that are also safer, right? Um, the third thing is, is that welcome itself is hard. And I want to admit that it's hard. And so this text, this text articulates just that. Um, plimo is a funny, is a funny Greek word. Uh, it's the name of a person. It's conflict. So the, this guy's name is conflict, even though he articulates himself as a big tzaddik. He's very righteous, and he says, an arrow in Satan's eye. Now, that's very an unwise thing to do. My grandmother would say, oh, what a terrible thing, poo, 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 throw salt in your shoulders. Uh, he did it. He did it. He said, and Erwin Satan's like, why? He knew that he gives a lot of money to charity. He takes care of the poor. He's a righteous person. And therefore, Satan has nothing on him. On the eve of the Day of Atonement, the Satan, by the way, some of you may know this, the Satan is not a demonic force in most of Jewish tradition. You know, you'll find it a little bit in the Kabbalah, but in most of Jewish tradition, the Satan is a curmudgeonly educator. Basically, trying to convince God that he probably was right, that we're not worth it. And that that's his job. His job is to basically puncture the balloons of our, you know, self-importance and to demonstrate that God's suspicion that this might not be worth it is right. That's his job. So he basically dresses up, he sees a poor man at the door, and bread was taken out to him because he asked for it. And the poor man pleaded with Plimo, um, on such a day as this when everyone's inside, shall I be outside? So he was taken into the house. On a day like this, he urged, when everyone sits at the table, shall I sit alone? And he was led to the table and sat down. Now before we go on in the story, um, this probably doesn't appear so unusual to you. Um, it is a story of how tiered our, uh, how, how careful our efforts of care and welcome can be. We start wanting to care, doing what? Writing a check, helping someone at a distance, and the demand then 
at this point in the story, moves closer. It moves to, okay, well, but one second, it's Erev Yom Kippur, you know, bring me in. And then, no, actually, he comes to the door and says, uh, you know, I actually want to sit at the table. At this juncture, Polimo decides, okay, come to the table. He sat. It was evident that his body was covered with oozing sores. And as well, he began to behave repulsively at the dinner table. Plimo rebuked him and said, sit properly. Said the poor man, give me a glass of liquor. And one was given him. He coughed and spat his phlegm into it. And they scolded him. Whereupon, after they shouted at him, Plimo fainted and died. Had a heart attack. Now, remember, don't get too worried. He's just the Satan dressed up as a poor man. Um, later, Plimo's household heard people crying out, Plimo's killed a man, Plimo's killed a man. And Plimo hid in an outhouse. By the way, why the outhouse? It's the lowliest place, right? He goes from the top of the wealthiest, you know, man in the city who gives all the tzedakah in the world. He's shivering in the public latrine because he feels like he's, it's Erev Yom Kippur and he killed a man. The Satan followed him there and Plimo fell before him, seeing how Plimo was suffering. The Satan disclosed his identity and said to him, why have you spoken in this way, saying an arrow in Satan's eyes? Then how am I to speak? You should say, let the merciful one rebuke Satan. Now, Satan's not a very nice guest, but this isn't a story about how guests should behave. It's a story about what is fundamentally demanded of Plimo. The poor man at the door is given bread. This is what we normally do. But the poor man wants more, and Plimo accommodates him. And then he wants more and Plimo accommodates his desire to be at the table. Now, well, to be in a word, to be included. Not to be given help, to be included. It's here at the table that Plimo begins to see with horror that his kindness is leading him towards something he's not prepared for, and that is a feeling of disgust and discomfort. He must not have noticed at first. The man's sick, maybe he's dying, Plimo is ruining this man's lovely Erev Yom Kippur dinner. The story ends brashly. Okay. He's hiding, huddled on the floor, caring for one who needs at the outmost limits of health and control is what people do for aging parents. It's what, it's what people do for sick people in hospitals who are no longer continent. It's what we do when we have a Seder and we know it will be ruined by Uncle Irving, who is annoying. But we know we have no choice but to welcome him. Here's the story here. We all deserve, we all deserve our little Erev Yom Kippur dinner parties. There is nothing wrong with our desire for an exclusive friendship circle of our folk. But when the knock comes at the door, are we prepared to trash it for the sake of being Abraham and Sarah? That is the question being asked. Are we prepared to lose the sweetness and comfort of being down our folks for the challenge of responding to the demands of a person in front of us that will wreck it, but they need us? That, for me, is the beginning of the challenge of question of welcome. Because welcome, what welcome really does is it challenges group identity and makes us uncomfortable in places where we felt comfort. It's what happens when the guys are playing, you know, uh, basketball. And um, this happened to me in high school when I was a kid. And some girl who's really good at basketball starts playing and messes up the feeling of the game. It's not, doesn't feel any, it doesn't feel the same way. It's when the teenagers have to deal with the kid who's awkward and letting him or her into the group will mess up the comfort and sense of real warmth. And that is the mitzvah of Achnasat Orchim, is to be willing to trash the sweetness and joy of the little communities of familiarity we love for the sake of something bigger. This is really hard work because, once again, you deserve your, 
your seders to be sweet, lovely experiences. But the really deeper question is, who are we as a people? And that is what Plimo is shivering about in the outhouse. Who am I? That my era of Yom Kippur was, my beautiful, sweet, lovely dinner was more important to me than Hachna Satorchi. This is the text I use when I teach your teens. There was once a man whose wife died and left him with an infant to suckle. He could not afford to pay a wet nurse. A miracle occurred and he grew breasts like the breasts of a woman and he nursed his child. Rav Yosef said, come and see how great this man is that such a miracle was performed for him. So Rav Yosef responds to the story and says, this man is a great man. He, he, he obviously must be because look what a miracle God performed for him. Abayah says, how bad is this man that the orders of nature were contorted for him? He must have been a terrible person because God can do miracles that aren't so ugly as this. There are other ways to feed hungry children. And I turn to kids, and I say to them, tell me, um, do you think that a man with breasts is a wonder like Rav Yosef or a monster like Abaye? Hmm. Don't answer that question. Do you think a gay person is more like a wonder like Rav Yosef or more like a monster like Abaye? No, don't answer that either. Answer this. What are the differences that scare you? What are the kinds of differences that make us feel really, really ill at ease, uncomfortable, and we want to leave? So I ask them, name, let's name it. I want to name it. People who are blind, people who are deaf, people who are in a wheelchair, people who are disfigured, people who are paraplegic, People who stutter, people who are very tall, very small, people who are very old, right? The list goes on, right? Then I say to them, what makes difference so scary? Why is difference scary? So what do you think they say? Why is difference so uncomfortable for us? It's unfamiliar, and therefore, since it's unfamiliar, we don't know how to behave. I don't know whether I'm supposed to look at what's disfigured on your face or look away or look or look away. I don't know, will I insult you if I like, if I mention the fact that, you know, I'm trying to, I'm hurrying and you're stuttering and it's taking too long and I gotta go. Like, how do I manage, like, addressing your difference? I, you know, I don't know how to address it. I don't know how to respond to it. I, I, it utterly disempowers me. Right? I, feel full, I really feel disempowered as a person. I'm capable. I can, you know, I talk to people. I'm very social. And with you, I just don't, I don't want to offend you. I don't, I don't know how to do it. I want to get out of here. Okay, that's, the, that's one thing kids say. What else do they say? That's it. It could have been me. Kids say it just like that. It could have been me. I could be in the wheelchair. I could have been born black. I could be, it could have been me. It could be me tomorrow. So here's what difference does. It raises up the chorus of fears of the true vulnerability that we all possess. Each one of us go home tonight, God willing, full-bodied enough to get home, and there's no guarantee that tomorrow will be the same. We are all human beings with profoundly vulnerable realities, both physical, emotional, and therefore other people's, other people's situations make us feel vulnerable. And so it could be me, and therefore I don't want to face that. I'm, I'm just uncomfortable facing the fact that I am that vulnerable. You know who knows this, by the way? Widows. For the, for the Shiva, everyone's great. And then a month later, all the widow's friends stop inviting her to go out and do things with her. Why? Because she represents the potential of losing a spouse and just subliminally, everyone's nervous about being with her because she represents the potential that we all know is true. You could lose a spouse. And so she becomes a somewhat, by the way, it's all subliminal. I don't know if it's how, how conscious it is, 
But I hear widows say this all the time. In other words, I just want to put on the table that the big sign in front of the synagogue that says we are welcoming is like such truly hard work because we actually have to struggle with disempowerment and vulnerability deeply. Now, I ask kids, how do you change a monster into a wonder? It's all about breaking through fear and vulnerability and disempowerment. And boy, do our kids need this. The truth is, we need it. The truth is, we need it. The mitzvah of hachnasat orchim is actually deeply difficult because it does threaten our sense of, of kind of calm, stability, normalcy. We are all happily addicted to familiarity. The challenge of hachnasat orchim is allow yourself the challenge of breaking through. And here's what happens. Not only do you become Abraham and Sarah welcoming indifference, but you become Abraham and Sarah welcoming indifference in ways that are not just good Jewish behaviors, but are actually pleasurable and rich and exciting and thrilling. You become actually excited by the difference that in the beginning scared you. Excited because you get perspectives you never thought of before because that difference shines new light into your world. So I want to kind of finish with just a little bit of the, the larger picture of this in regard to the work that I do. This picture of Abraham and Sarah's tent, open on all four sides and welcome to strangers, is exactly the polar opposite of what was going on in the city of Sodom. And that is why these two polar opposites are right after each other. The story of Sodom is right afterwards. Sodom, according to the rabbis, is a closed city with all closed doors. You couldn't get in it except if you were wealthy. It's like a Floridian gated community, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and, and according to the rabbis, they had such wealth they didn't want to share with the poor travelers. So they said, no one's allowed to come in who's poor because we don't want them to see what we have and want it and ha we have to share it. In other words, in Sodom, your need is my loss. How many people do you get, by the way, this is part of the debate in America on what? On immigration. Your need is my loss. And what does this principle say? Your need is my opportunity. Your need is my opportunity to care and grow. What an incredible difference, right? One other, one other thing. In Sodom, there was a bed that they put on the side. This is the rabbis talking in Midrashic language. And this bed was for wayfarers. And if you were too short, they stretched you. It was a rack. And if you were too long, they cut off your feet. Now, what's that called? We know from Greek myth. It's a Procrustes. It's, it's the story of Procrustes' bed. Procrustes had a bed. It was a Greek, you know, a Greek character in the mythology. And he did this to people until Theseus actually, you know, basically put him on the bed and killed him. And so the story here is this really remarkable. The rabbis are borrowing a Greek myth to tell you that Sodom is a place that doesn't like difference. Sodom is not a place of wild, by the way, it's just last week we read it. Sodom is a place of not of wild sexual expression. No, it's a place of fear of human need and fear of difference. So much fear that they are willing to act violently against Lot, who's welcoming strangers into his home, violating the ethic of Sodom. And what's the best way to humiliate and debase and demean strangers? Rape. You violate our, our boundaries that are there to protect us from the world, and we will violate yours. The work that I do is to help people grasp in my community that the principles in the Hebrew Bible are, are designed to frame a kind of responsiveness to the kind of world that, you know, that Sodom is shaping. Abraham and Sarah are the anti-Sodom. And that world is a world of dis not, not fear of the needs of others, but connectedness to the community that passes behind, past your door, and a welcome of, of anybody who needs your help.
We are, in our community, creating rebel shuls, rebel communities. Communities that, while committed to their own ethos and their own vibrancy and their own uniqueness, are struggling to find ways to welcome in all kinds of people who have never been welcomed in before. In my community, there's a real desperate need for young people to feel that their families will not reject them. And all over the American Jewish community, there's a need for a deeper commitment to the inclusion of people who don't fit our normative frames of happy heterosexual folks who find each other, get married, and have three kids. We have to find room in our community for all the different various life stories that happen to Jews and find a way to celebrate them all. It's been a pleasure to be with you and to learn with you and to talk with you, and I'm happy to take some questions as we finish. Thank you very much. So are there examples of communities that are doing it well and how we could do it better? So I would say that there are, in, the, in the liberal community, in the, in the reform community, I think it's, there's lots of great models of doing it well. Um, but I, I would say that part of the challenge is, is that doing it well doesn't mean to simply put a sign up or put it on your logo of your shul. It means to actually figure out how we engage with welcoming people who don't ordinarily feel like the synagogue is about them or about the, you know, their lives. Now, this includes all kinds of people who aren't gay or lesbian or trans. It includes lots of single people feel that they don't feel that they have a, a place in the Jewish community because there's so much pressure on marriage and kids. So I kind of think that it, it requires a, a, a community effort that offers a whole array of opportunities for people that may be new and different. So for example, um, I, I think diversity actually right now is gonna be carried by um, a, a whole array of, of young people who are saying this is what we want. So you have to be willing to let your leaderships welcome in young people. Um, leaderships, for that matter, welcome in the newly converted. Um, leaderships, by the way, you may be doing this already, and if you are, you know, kudos to you. Um, leadership's welcoming in people who are disabled or handicapped. Leadership's welcoming in people of color. You know, there was once a time where kind of like we all knew what a Jew looked like. Who knows what a Jew looks like today? There's no such thing. There are black Jews and yellow Jews and red Jews and white Jews and brown Jews. So our broad broadening of expectation. And by the way, it's an educational, it's an educational theme too. It's like, it's, a, it's about, maybe it's a, it, it, in, in a kind of deeper way. Um, what we all perhaps need to do is to break out of the white Ashkenazi head we've got. Not, some people may not be white or Ashkenazi in the room, but most of us in the leadership positions are white Ashkenazi. We see ourselves that way. The question is, if we are actually committed to welcome, what does it mean to actually seek out non-white, non-Ashkenazi Jews to actually be part of our world too? So it's, it's, it's that. In other words, it's, it's breaking beyond, like, in a way, it's expecting difference that isn't quite yet appeared to, to, uh, to come make room for them even before they have. Um, it, there's more to say, but I'd rather take you know, more questions. I, I want to actually invite you to explore um, one thing that I, I, I don't think that uh, is very common. I think that one thing that can be really done in a community like this is to really mobilize uh, the non-Jewish community that's working on, on difference and inclusion and figure out how you can learn from them. There's a lot being done in the larger community. Um, uh, the, one, the best example I gave is how the, American, the school systems all over the place are, are creating GSAs all over the country. Um, I think that there's wisdom out there about how to manage this that we haven't brought in from the larger non-Jewish community and moreover from, from organizations that are national that are working on these issues, like the, you know, the um, AJWS, and, uh, and uh, Jews for Justice and, and other similar organizations. While you had a panel about five years ago at this point of three gay 
uh, grads and one undergrad. It was revolutionary. Uh, they set up chairs and announced it. Uh, there were 150 chairs in the room and 800 people showed up. And they had to turn away nearly 200. And um, it was an amazing standing room only event where four young men each had a half hour to tell their story about what it was like. It was riveting, unbelievable. The Rebbies were not happy when it was done. They were unhappy, but it was actually quite a successful affair. What we're seeing now is this, is that your children or grandchildren are already beyond this problem, most of them. They are already not concerned about whether someone's gay, straight. Trans, the trans community is still struggling because it's still extremely difficult for a kid. We had a kid in a, in a, in a community that in, in the Midwest, kid is 13 years old, well, 12, says to uh, the mother, uh, Ima, and this is in a religious family, I don't want a bar mitzvah, I want a bat mitzvah. My name is an X, it's Y. And um, the mother sat down and began to kind of figure out what this meant. And uh, the synagogue uh, has not allowed her to return since. Meaning she now dresses as a girl. She's gotten, they, they went to an endocrinologist, they went to you know a psychologist. She was diagnosed as clearly a trans kid and what they do in those situations is provide, um, they actually uh, slow down or block puberty so that, so that the kid's body doesn't begin to transgress. Because you know, if you feel you're a girl and your body gets more and more and more male as you're 13, and those changes are physically hard to undo. So if they delay puberty, they can give a kid three or four years to clarify and become certain that that's what they want. You can always restart puberty, but once it's started, you can't undo what the body has already transformed to do. So these things are occurring and, and all kinds of communities are struggling to figure out what to do. I mean, schools are being challenged. What happens, I know that in Solomon Schechter's school in, in New York, there was a kid that was trans and the community did an excellent job from teachers to administrators to students, of finding a way to actually get their head around the fact that, you know, that, uh, you know, whatever, that, you know, Shimon was now Sarah, and it, and it succeeded. It's not an easy, clearly an easy affair, but it's, but it's happening. That process, by the way, let me just say, I run an organization called Eshel, and I had 20 rabbis on the phone talking about transgender people. I had two transgender Orthodox Jews talking. We, I mean, I run an organization. We have maybe 15 transgender people come every year to this organization's national retreat. And two of them were on the phone with 20 rabbis. Two of their parents were on the phone with 20 rabbis. And I had two experts at another time. It's happening slowly, very slowly. Here's what I'm going to tell you what's really going on in the, in, in, the, in, in the Orthodox world. By the way, it's true in the angelical world and the Catholic world. Empathy is real. There's hardly anybody out there. I even would tell you that in many Haredi places, there's a growing empathy. What rabbis feel is they have no, they have no solution to a problem, and therefore they feel stuck. They feel stuck. And so that stuckness gets translated into bad policy often. But the empathy is growing. The YU story eight years or six years ago, I think it was six years ago, it was a piece of that shift. My writing, the film Trembling Before God was a piece of that shift. I think things are moving in a very positive way. Um, what is the major halakhic objection? Oh, sorry. What is the major halakhic objection from the Orthodox community to this? And what is your response? <laughs> in in uh, standing on one foot. <laughs> yeah, so I'll stand on one foot, hold my book, and say, "You can take a look. It's only three hundred and some pages." And look, here's what I'm gonna uh, say: that um, uh, what I just shared with you about Sodom is actually, I think, a, a significant piece of the story. I think the prohibition in Leviticus is really about violence. It's about rape and violence, maybe about idolatry, but it's not about the love between two people who
who are mutual, and it's, it's just not, it can't be about that. Now, I think I've got evidence to demonstrate that that's a fair reading, but that's, you know, you can judge for yourself when you read the book. That is um, a very difficult position for many Orthodox rabbis for all kinds of reasons I don't want to go into now, but I would tell you that I really think that what's really mo moving right now is, is not the halachic frame, per se. The halachic frame is often, like, like in, the, in the legal system as well, the law is often the last thing to change in social change. We, often, we ought not expect the law to lead the way. Sometimes the law comes in the middle of social change, as it did in the civil rights movement. And as it's going to do now, it will probably be in the next few years that the, cha you know, the, the challenge of same-sex marriage will come to the Supreme Court. Who knows what they will say? But there was very much resistance from the gay community to bring to the Supreme Court this question two or three years ago. Because if, you, if the Supreme Court does not feel it's got a significant portion of the states behind it, they won't make uh, grand challenges to the ethos of the community. They won't do it, even if they think it's right. So I would say this is what happens. Law changes slower. And so here's the point. What every community needs to do is have praxes of tolerance, acceptance, warmth, and love that precede reasons. Reasons will come later. The first thing we need to do is get rabbis to realize they have human beings in front of them who are threatened and who are scared and who need help and who need their support. Let me tell you one conversation I had, I shared it with the parents um, two nights ago. I spoke to the, one of the lead rabbis in America who was, was once the RCA, the president of the Rabbinical Council of America. And uh, I said to him, so what do you do when you, you know, meet gay people? He said, well, Steve, my heart goes out to them, but they have to be celibate because of the verse in Leviticus. So, and if you're not familiar with the verse, it's, you know, in chapter 18, verse 22, ve'ed zachar, and with a male, lo tishkav, you shall not lie, mishkiv ve'isha, the lying's of a woman, it's an abomination. And that, so it's very clear, supposedly very clear. So, uh, so that's the story. So I, I, I said to him, well, tell me, will you, will you go into a little role play with me? So it was a mistake for him to say yes, he said yes. <laughs> and um, I said, I'm Gabe, and I'm 16, and I'm terrified, and I'm gay. Um, well, what does God want from me? So what are you going to tell me? So he was silent, and I said, hmm, well, would you tell him what you just told me? That uh, you will never be touched, you'll never be loved, you'll never have intimacy, when you're sick, there'll be no one to take care of you. When you're happy, no one to dance with. When you're sad, no one to cry with. All because something's wrong with you. I wouldn't say it like that. I wouldn't put it that way. Good, how would you put it? So he said to me, okay, Steve, how would you put it? Um, so I said this. Try this. Could you say, Gabe, I too don't know why God makes gay people and gives them a nearly impossible life trajectory. I so honor your struggle because honestly, I don't know what I would do were I in your shoes. So you do the best you can and you go to Shemaim, you go to heaven when you stand in front of that you know, throne of judgment and you, you give a damn good argument why the, you made the choices you made. There's 612 meets vote. I know better how to help you on. Join my shoe. <laughs> could you say that? And he said, I think I could. I said, okay, let me push you one more step. He agreed. I don't know why. He agreed. <laughs> could you imagine saying to Gabe, Gabe, I'm 35 years older than you. I will probably be in heaven before you get there. I want to make you this promise now that uh, when you sit in front of that, stand in front of that Kisei HaKavod, that holy throne, and you give your argument for why you did what you did, why you lived the life you led, 
I want you to know I will be behind you cheering you on. When you finally begin to ask God what, what the, you know, the depth of this question, God, why did you make me gay and write in the Torah these words? I'm going to be there and be cheering you on. He began to get teary-eyed. And I, I basically said to him, look, uh, I won't give you his name. We'll call him Shlomo. Um, Shlomo, you don't have to solve his problem. you got to identify with it. you got to adopt it. And that is what's going on. What's going on with the successful, with the rabbis who I consider are allies, they are adopting the existential crisis of kids without fully getting the exact solution halachically to the problem. And they are not putting that as the kind of gatekeeper to the, to the emotional response. There's a fellow named Avi Orlo, who if you haven't heard, you should hear. He's the rabbi of the Foundation for Jewish Camping. He's a dear friend, he's a lovely fellow, and he saw something on a blog that a Christian pastor had written called Promises to My Gay Children, and he thought, I'm going to read this. He read it, and he thought, you know what? An Orthodox rabbi needs to write a similar piece. You can go online, Promises to My... Orthodox rabbi wrote Promise, eight promises to my gay children. He doesn't have gay children. His children are this big. He doesn't know that they're gay, but he wanted to make clear, if my children are gay, I want them to know this now. And he wrote eight things all about support, love, right? all about the, like, exactly the kind of expectation, emotional expectation you would expect a parent to have for a kid. And your gayness won't matter. And it went viral on the internet. And Avi Orlo is an Orthodox rabbi. So here's what I want to suggest, is that it's already moving in this direction, in a direction where where the legal solutions are going to be put on the side and the, and the interpersonal solutions and communal solutions are going to be put on the front of the burners. And so rabbis are going to say, listen, it doesn't matter to me. I don't know how to solve the halachic problems, but we have lots of people in our shul that aren't perfect Jews. So why, like, what's the big deal here? We'll solve that problem when we get to it, maybe. But right now, I've got people in my shul who are on Shomer Shabbos, and I've got people in my shul who don't go in the mikvah. You think I'm going to bother the fact that you're doing something in your bedroom that's problematic? i got half of my shul that I wonder what they're doing in their bedrooms. What are you talking about? So on some level, that pragmatic frame, that, that the privacy of people in their bedrooms is between them, their partner, and God, is fair. We do it already. Why can't we do it here? So on some level, there's a misnomer that until we solve the halachic conundrum, that halachic conundrum is going to take a while to solve. What we really need to do is create communities that are going to prioritize relationship over, you know, over, over the norm, at least in terms of this. Now, let me just say one thing about this. What really is happening, it's not really halacha most of the time, in my view. It's homophobia dressed up with payas. Because all kinds of people who aren't religious, I get this from Israelis all the time. Israelis who are not religious at all will quote you Leviticus on this issue. So it's basically about using the religious frame to legitimate a discomfort that's emotional that eventually, you know, if we work with people, we can shift. You know, uh, as a rabbi, it's important to me that, uh, that the deeper sensibilities of our desire to welcome all kinds of difference are deep within the tradition. They're not, they're not modern impositions upon it. So uh, if you open up the book of Genesis, you see that God creates a world in six days. And uh, on every day it says, you know, by Elohim, ki tov. Ki tov. And God saw it, it was good. Okay, good. And so it's true, the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, sixth day, it's very good. Tov ma'od. What's the first not good thing in creation? Lo tov, comes in the next chapter. Lo tov, it's not good. Le'el levado. It's not good for the human being to be alone. The first problem in creation, the first mistake in creation is human loneliness. So what's the solution? Okay, so I said, Azer Kenegdo, I'll make a helpmeet for the person. What happens next? 
So most people in their heads think God makes Eve. No, it's not true. God makes all the animals, all the various animals, and brings them to Adam, and Adam does not find a helpmeet. The rabbis of the 2nd and 3rd century are quite confused by this. They think, really, this is strange. And Rashi says the following. Adam had sex with every animal and beast, and his jets were not cooled. The rabbis are imagining, imagining that Adam is going out on dates. God's setting Adam up on dates with a rhinoceros and an emu, a camel, who knows what. You can imagine, you know. I have this picture of, you know, God and Adam kind of talking it out, and God keeps suggesting to him dates. Okay, what about a wildebeest? Let's try. You know, he comes home. Oh, you're crazy. It was awful. Okay, you know, tomorrow we'll try an emu. You know, it'll be better, fluffy. You know, <laughs> I, I love the humor in this, but there's something really deep that's being said. When it comes to the sun and the moon and the stars, God knows what is good. When it comes to the lonely heart of this creature he has created that is independent and free, God cannot know what's good. There's no way for God to control the free heart of a person who needs love, intimacy, and companionship. The only thing God can do is send us out on dates to discover it and to trust that when we find intimacy, love, and companionship, we will know it. It's been a pleasure to learn with you these past three days. Thank you so much. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.